Ephesians chapter 6. We're talking about spiritual warfare. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, or should I say, finally, Faith Harvest Church, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Faith Harvest Church, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. When I come across many believers, and especially when we talk about spiritual warfare, many believers, even in Nagaland, and maybe even in this church, we tend to treat spiritual warfare or uh, demons as, or, or Satan as too extreme a topic. Some of us have this mindset that spiritual warfare is something that exists in the realm of fairy tales. And we think that talking about demons and <clears throat> Satan has no place in this modern scientific world. Some of us have the opinion that when we talk a lot about demons and Satan and his strategies and spiritual warfare, that it is just the imaginations of overzealous, uneducated prayer warriors or pastors, maybe of some specific denomination. Both of these attitudes are wrong. You see, Satan would want you to think like that. And to think like that is basically unbelief. Satan would want you to think like that as long as you never come to the knowledge of the truth. And you never come to the knowledge of this truth unless you begin treating this message as truth. Amen. You see, as Christians, we need to form our worldview and our beliefs from the Word of God. Science may say one thing. Human philosophy may say another. The world may say another thing. But truth is what the Word of God says. Can you say Amen? Amen. And if the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Then what that means is, that's what it means. I mean, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against flesh and blood or human beings, but against principalities and powers and might. Satan and his demonic hordes that are arraigned against the church. And that means you and I to hinder us in fulfilling God's purposes and extending His kingdom on this earth. Amen. So the wise believer will seek to know how he can defend himself, arm himself so that he is victorious in this warfare. And of course, spiritual warfare is not just something that we can teach in seven to eight sermons. There's a whole lot that goes with it. Character development is an area of spiritual warfare because if you grow in character and holiness, you are closing doors to the enemy to begin to work in your life. So it's not just about finding out how the devil operates and casting him out in Jesus' name. No, it's a lot more to do about renewing our mind and our character and walking in love and all of that. The whole counsel of God's word. But we are specifically targeting this area because we want to teach on how you can use the armor that God has given to you so that you can be victorious in this warfare. You see, the foolish believer would say that this topic is not for me. Would have no interest in this topic and pay no attention to it. For our own loss. Amen. Hallelujah. Because we all know we have an enemy called Satan who hates us. And the Bible says he wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life. Make you ineffective in serving the Lord. Amen. And many times he simply uses our own weaknesses against us. He uses our own <clears throat> thoughts and beliefs against us. So we need to know and be forearmed in this. All right, let's go on reading. Verse 13. <clears throat> therefore, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, the Bible says, therefore, 
Take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You see, when the evil day comes, or when trial comes, or temptation comes, and it will come to everyone on this earth, as long as you're alive, it will come. God doesn't want you to be defeated. He wants you to stand. Today we're going to talk about the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and the lungs of intercession or prayer. So let's look at that. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. What does that mean? How can this be a weapon, a defense for me in spiritual warfare? See, Roman soldiers wore a helmet that was ornate, beautifully decorated, made of heavy brass, very heavy, that was tightly fitted around the head. And the purpose of that was simply to protect the head <clears throat> from the attacks of the enemy, to protect the head in battle. Now, what does the head have to do with terms of, in regard to spiritual warfare? Simply this, if you have been attending uh, all the services in spiritual warfare, we found out through the scripture that Satan's primary strategy is lies and deception. The Bible says he has already been stripped of all his power. Amen. So really the enemy has no power except that he is a deceiver and a liar. Amen. And his main strategy is to bring this deception, false beliefs, false thoughts, false ideas to the mind of men. That's why in verse 11 says, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles means method. And 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says, we are not ignorant of his devices. And that word devices means something to do with the intellect. So, so Satan's primary strategy is to plant deception and lies in the mind of men in order to take men captive to do his bidding and his will. For whoever controls the mind controls the men. And we see in human history and even today that entire communities, entire countries are held captive to Satan, not because he has the power and the ability, but because he has planted lies and deceptions in the mind of people through false religion, through false philosophies that has become a stronghold of belief in the hearts and minds of the people that it begins to affect the way that they live today. One of that is the philosophy of karma that holds hundreds of millions of people in India bound, blinded to the truth of God's word. The philosophy of the transmigration of the soul that believes that according to how you are in this life, you'll be born in the other life, either in a higher way or in a lower way. And that kind of belief holds people captive so that they begin to live their lives out of that belief, thereby being blinded to the truth of God's Word. Amen. So spiritual warfare has a lot to do with how you keep your mind. And of course, primarily with the truth of God's word. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The word high thing actually refers to philosophies, thoughts, attitudes, logic, Wisdom of men, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, so it has to do with knowledge, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Paul here is talking about spiritual warfare. In verse 3, he talks about how we do not walk in the flesh, but we war according to the Spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, 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 strongholds. Those strongholds are in our minds. What are the strongholds? Arguments, philosophies, beliefs, 
thoughts that have been built up in our mind over years and years of repeated behavior, years and years of repeated thought and living. Culture is one of the primary ways that Satan brings this stronghold in the minds of people. Amen. But when you come to know the Lord, God's is saying, now you need to renew your mind. You need to change the way you think. And there are strongholds in your mind that are impeding your progress in God. That is hindering the way God wants to bless you. So you need to get rid of that stronghold in your mind. How? Cast down that philosophy, that argument, that attitude that is opposed to the knowledge of God. Unforgiveness. Some people just can't forgive. It's a stronghold in your mind. It needs to be brought captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen. That's why culture must be subject to Christ. If you become a Christian, Christ is your only culture. If you are lifting up your own culture above Christ, then I tell you, you will not be walking in many of the blessings that God has for you in this life. God still loves you and we still do. But it will impede your progress in God. If that culture is opposed to the truth of God's word. Certain things in the culture is good. If they're biblical, by all means follow it. If they are biblical, by all means get rid of it. Hallelujah. Strongholds in our minds must be brought captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen. How do we do that? Well, by the knowledge of the truth of God's word. More specifically, the knowledge of the truths of salvation. Can you say salvation? salvation. That's why the Bible says he's the helmet of salvation. I mean, of course, the grace of God will receive you. But then it would be tragic to find out there was so much in this life you could have experienced and known and grown in God. And the reward that is available after you die. Amen. Hallelujah. So we should have a heart to experience everything God has for us. And to have all the rewards that He wants us to have. Amen. Now we know that salvation is a finished work. Titus 3 verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Past tense. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So salvation is a finished work. Can you say finished work? When Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice, his death, his burial and resurrection has completed forever the work of salvation. And Jesus is not going to go back on the cross. Jesus is not going to shed his blood again. Why? Because it is one work forever. For eternity, it is a finished work. And today, we just need to take that message to the world and tell them your sins are already forgiven. Only receive it by faith. Hallelujah. If he could give his own life for me, then why don't, why can't he love me today? Amen. But when he gave his life, on the cross in Christ Jesus the Bible says he has already blessed me with every spiritual blessing by his stripes I have been healed on the cross amen so the knowledge of redemption is like a helmet because you renew your mind with the knowledge of redemption what has Jesus done for me? What has Jesus given to me? His promises. You keep on filling that in your mind. And it's like a helmet that protects you from the fiery darts of the enemy. The lies of the enemy that want to come and tell you that what Christ did on the cross was not good enough. You still have to work harder. You see, the cross settles forever the truth that God has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing. The cross settles forever the fact that we are now accepted and loved 
because of Jesus. Everything that God has, He has given to us because of Jesus and what He did on the cross. So the helmet of salvation simply means fill your minds with the knowledge of salvation. I said, I don't know. Welcome to Bible study on Wednesday. And we'll tell you. Amen. Fill your mind with the consciousness of what Jesus has done on the cross. In other words, be grace conscious. Be cross conscious. Be blood conscious. The blood of Jesus has whipped the devil. It's not your goodness that whips the devil. It's the blood of Jesus. Be blood conscious. Keep that in your mind. Let the beautiful truths of salvation be like a helmet that you adorn your head with and meditate on them continually. Fit them tightly as a soldier would do his helmet. Specifically, the truths of what you have in Christ. Can you say what I have in Christ? Who I have become in Christ. Can you say that again? Who I have become in Christ. And lastly, what I can do in Christ. Come and say it louder. What I can do in Christ. These are the three main truths that you must major on in order to grow spiritually. What I have in Christ. And I have righteousness as a gift. I have total forgiveness. I have acceptance. I have an inheritance. I have an anointing every believer has. Who I have become in Christ. I've become a new creation, an heir of God, a son of God, a co-heir with Christ, a person of great value. And what I can do, the Bible said you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Hallelujah. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Not through yourself, but through Christ. So don't just rely on your own self. Don't just look to yourself and see what you can do by your own abilities. Look to Christ and see what He can do through you. Amen. These truths will protect your mind like a helmet from being taken captive by lies and deception. As a Christian, you must come to the place where you say, the Bible is my only philosophy and my only truth. And the more you grow in God, the more you don't want to read anything else by the Bible. Amen. Even other Christian books. Secondly, we're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit. Can you say the sword of the Spirit? You keep the sword in a scabbard or in a sheath, and it's always tied to the belt. And we know that the belt that the armor of Roman soldier wore refers to the Word of God. Amen. So the sword of the Spirit is related to and comes out of the Word of God. Can you see that? The belt of truth, which is the Word of God. Amen. The sword is connected to it. You have to take out the sword for battle. So the sword of the Spirit comes out of the Word of God. Now, the belt of truth is also the Word of God. In verse 17, the sword of the Spirit is also the Word of God. So what is the difference? There are two Greek words for the word word. Did you follow that? There are two Greek words for the word word. In English, there's only one word, word. In the Greek, there are two words. One is the word logos. Can you say logos? Logos means the written word. It simply means it's an idea. The idea of God. Logos is the entire revelation of God's scripture. That is logos. What you have in your hand is the logos. It means it is God's communication. Amen. God's communication to men. What you read every morning is the logos word of God. What you memorize is the Logos, Word of God. As a young child, Jesus memorized the Old Testament. That is the Logos. That is God's communication. It's God's idea. Amen. But the word in verse 17 is another Greek word for word called Rema. R-H-E-M-A. Rema. Can you say Rema? Rema means an utterance or 
the spoken word. Rema simply means the word that is quickened or inspired by the Holy Spirit. The spoken word, the quickened word. For example, many years ago, I was going through a phase where I really was finding it difficult to sleep. My mind was under tremendous pressure, uh, personal life and ministry. And there were times I would wake up in the middle of the night, sweating, anxiety, tremendous oppression and just darkness that I was going through, struggling with certain things inside my heart, in my walk with the Lord, and really even physically. And I felt like my mind was such under such tremendous pressure that it would snap any time. And I would just sleep for two hours, I would wake up, worry, anxiety. So one night at around 3 a.m. I woke up and since I had nothing to do, I decided I'm just going to read the scriptures. So I was reading the scriptures. And I was reading Luke chapter 21. And I was just reading. And that word about what Jesus was doing here and there did not really have a specific impact in my life at that moment because I was going through something else and what I was reading was just the word. But when I came to verse 19, everyone say verse 19. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. I was just trying to see whether you are sleeping or awake. When I came to verse 19, as I read that verse, and it simply says, By patience, possess your soul. When I read that word, it was like a flash of lightning in my soul. Because when I read the scripture, it was like it was quickened to me directly by the Lord. As if God himself, at that moment, whispered that verse into my heart, into my spirit. And as I read it, it was the answer to my situation. Because a lot of it was compounded because of my impatience. Wanted to have a worldwide ministry after just being three years in the ministry. Impatience. A lot of your worries and anxieties, brothers and sisters, is because of your impatience. It's not that God doesn't want to give you. You just want it in your time even before you are ready to have it. And because you don't have it, you get worried and anxious. And you want to push, and you want to pull, and you want to put pressure on people to make things happen. And God says, chill, man. Rest. Just relax. Faith means relaxing. When you are pushing and striving, you are not in faith. No matter how spiritual you may look. If you are praying a lot, but you're praying simply to pull, to push, to make things happen, you're out of faith. Your prayer is not in faith. Faith is a rest. And what the Lord spoke to me was, by patience, possess your souls. Let your mind and your emotions be subjected by patience. Amen. So that was a grandma word to me, because that word came with the breath of the Spirit on it. Amen. And at that very moment, all the stress, the fear, the oppression just lifted. The enemy withdrew. And from that moment on, I saw victory in my situation. That is what I mean by the sword of the Spirit. It is a word that is quickened to me, whether through the Bible, a prophecy, or a word given to me by the Holy Spirit, or maybe just someone coming and exhorting you. And the word devil is the Greek word diabolos, which simply means he keeps on throwing. He keeps on attacking again and again and again and again. He's persistent. So with all the other armor, you're protecting yourself, but you are not getting that upper hand. But with the sword of the Spirit, when you wait upon the Lord and you come under Him, as what Ron Bruce was saying, come under Him, push into a relationship with Christ, seek Him. Wait upon him, and when he quickens the word to you, and when you wield it, it's like a sword that you thrust into the danger of the enemy, and victory is yours. Hallelujah. Like Jesus in the wilderness, when he was tempted of the enemy 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil came and said to him, the devil didn't come and said, wow, you know, scaring him with power and might. No, the devil came how? With suggestions. Like I said, the fiery darts of the enemy are suggestions, thoughts, ideas the enemy plants in your mind. The devil came and told Jesus, if you are the Son of God, that's a suggestion. 
turn these stones into bread. What does Jesus do? It is written in the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. Hallelujah. For all the three times that he was tempted, all those three times he used the spoken word of God. The word that was quickened to him by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That means Jesus first had to also memorize the word. He had to have the logos in his heart before it became a rema. Many of us want a rema from God, but we have no logos in sight. Not, not interested in logos at all. No Bible, no Bible study, no, I don't want, I'm not interested. No church. I just want a rema. Lord, what do you want me to do in life? Lord, what is your will for me? Who do you want me to marry? What business do you want me to start? What is your call on my life? Many young people, they're crying out, looking for answers, but never go to the Word of God from which your answer will spring forth. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I believe the armor of God goes beyond verse 17 to verse 18 to include prayer. The word spare or lance is not used, but I believe it is implied in this verse because of what we know and understand about the effectiveness and power of prayer and intercession. We believe prayer is like a lance or a spear in the armor of God. You see, lance or a spear was used as an offensive weapon. It was longer than a sword, many of them about five feet, six feet. And you could use that to throw off the opponent before he comes near. That means you keep him at a distance. It could also be thrown at a distance to kill an enemy from far away. So what it does is that it makes the soldier effective and untouchable from a distance. Prayer is what does that to believers. Prayer brings that benefit, that ability and power to believers. Many of us, we treat prayer lightly, not understanding the power and the effectiveness of it in a warfare against the devil. The Bible says, pray always with all prayer and supplication. In the Amplified Bible says, all manners of prayer. That means there are different types of prayer. We know there's a prayer of consecration, the prayer of petition, the prayer of urgent need, the prayer of faith, the prayer of thanksgiving, the prayer of intercession. There are many, many different ways of praying. It's not just praying. Of course, it just begins with opening your mouth and just speaking words to your father and being real and being honest. But then as you pick up the word of God and you begin to learn the principles of prayer and the different types of prayer, you begin to know what prayer to use in what situation. But the issue here is not the different types of prayer, but more the power and the effectiveness and the importance of prayer. Let me just say this. I believe many trials, temptations and attacks and backsliding can be avoided if we maintain an effective prayer walk with God. It's just as simple as that. You will be able to avoid many of the problems in your life or attacks if you would just maintain a strong prayer life. I'm not saying that if you begin a strong prayer life, you will never have any problem. Yes, you will have. But the ones who pray will probably go through it stronger than those who don't. The ones who pray will probably go through it without being affected than those who don't pray. See, the exciting thing about walking with God, walking in the Spirit with God, is that God can and does reveal things like attacks of the enemy, problems, temptations, accidents that can be avoided if we believers would simply respond and obey in prayer. Especially when we pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit. We ridicule people who pray in tongues 
And you know why? Because Satan wants you to really good. Because praying in tongues is such a powerful tool God has given to the church. The Satan knows that if believers will get into praying in tongues and learn to pray in tongues and begin to use this, it gives them tremendous power and weapon to destroy the weapons of darkness, the attacks of the enemy. And so he will bring up a lot of false ideas, false teachings, and ridicule around this specific doctrine and teaching. Why? But that by fear, believers don't pray in tongues. Because we fear what others will say. We fear what the church leaders would say. Because we are so conscious of ourselves that we don't get into this as we should. As we should. I believe one of the primary ways that you can intercede is in tongues. Because a lot of intercession, you don't know what you're praying. You just have a sense of an urgent need, a burden in your heart. Someone calls you and says, there's someone dying in the ICU, please pray. That's all the information you have. How much long do you, do you need to pray that in English? One minute. Father is an urgent need, please heal him. What more do I say after that in English? I can't keep on saying, please heal him, please heal him, please heal him, because that would be repetitive prayer, out of faith, unbelief. Only the Holy Spirit knows how that situation needs to be prayed. And that's what Romans 8.32 says, We do not know how we should pray as we ought to, but the Spirit of God makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That verse is simply saying the Holy Spirit takes hold together with our spirit and as we yield ourselves to pray in tongues, allowing Him to pray through us by His prayer language, then we are interceding the mind and the will of God. Amen. Prayer has preventative power that we should understand. preventative power of prayer and intercession. Abraham prayed to God not to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And he interceded. And he told God, Lord, if there be 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, don't bring this judgment. God said, yes, if there is 10, I want. Unfortunately, there was not 10. The only righteous family was Lot. And in our sense of righteousness, he was not righteous. But yet in God's eyes, he was righteous. Amen. So Lord was saved, but Sodom was destroyed. Moses interceded with God for the Israelites. Two or three times God wanted to say, I'm going to remove this people and I'm going to start a new nation from you, Moses. But Moses pleaded on behalf of Israel. And God relented. God said, all right, I will not do it. That is intercession. Unfortunately, many believers enter into serious prayer only in a moment of crisis or great need. Maybe if you would have a stronger prayer line, you would not have entered that situation in the first place. Amen. It's not only about a need in that, but prayer transforms. So that as we spend more time in prayer, it deals with those character effects and defects in our lives. It transforms you so that the problems that could have come in your life because of your character fault would not come. Why? Because as you spend time in the presence of God in prayer, you were changed. God dealt with those attitudes. Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of the things that we may have in the heart, like unforgiveness, wrong attitudes, pride, God deals with us as we spend time in prayer. As we spend time in prayer. I believe it is absolutely essential a minimum of one hour of prayer a day for believers. One hour a day. Pastor, that sounds like the law. No, it's not the law. 
We are living in a time of grace. And God's grace will help you to pray one hour a day. <laughs> it's absolutely essential, especially in this day and age. When we are in the last days, the Satan's activity is being multiplied. The evil is increasing. And when your own flesh doesn't want to flow in the things of God, just make yourself pray one hour a day. Just do it. Don't question. Don't reason the theology or praying one hour a day. Just do it. <laughs> and if you are in the ministry, you better be praying. Or there will come a time when you will just have to leave the ministry. Either the Spirit will get you out, or either something will happen that will just cause you not to be able to function in that ministry. Amen. But now when the Holy Spirit reveals things to us that we can pray for in prayer, or about the future, or things that may come, He does so that we can pray for three things. Number one, to avoid it. Number two, to lessen the impact of it in our lives. Because some things cannot be avoided. All of us went through the difficult financial situation one and a half to two years back. Yes or no? All of us went through, the whole world went through it. But the Holy Spirit revealed that to a lot of people and they prayed so that in their own life, the impact was lessened. Amen. There was a cushion. Why? Because they had seen their head and they had prayed. And the Holy Spirit had given them wisdom to operate in that situation of lack and famine and economic turmoil so that they were not affected as others. Are you with me? Or number three, to strengthen you and give you the wisdom as you go through it. Amen. So the best way to pray is to pray by the Holy Spirit. Pray in tongues. The longer you pray in tongues, I tell you, the more powerful you'll be as a believer. There are times I've been so discouraged. There are times I've been so tired in my walk with the Lord. Doesn't even want to pray. Don't even want to read. All I could do was just pray in tongues. So I would lock myself up in my room and just pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Half an hour, nothing happens. One hour, nothing happens. Just pray. Pray. And there would come a time that it was almost like I hit something. Like a stream or a flow. And as I just began praying and began praying, that excitement and that enthusiasm and that energy, that spiritual force, to want to serve God, to want to preach, it just begins to be reignited, begins to be reinforced. And I come out of the time of prayer as if I never went through the time of discouragement, but I did. The Bible says, if you pray in tongues, you are edifying yourself. You are building yourself up, strengthening yourself. In Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He who prays in tongues edifies himself, strengthens himself up. So if there is no one to pray for you, if there is no one to come and lay hands on you, if there is no place where you can find fellowship with other believers, just lock yourself up in your bedroom and pray in tongues. Then the Holy Spirit will show up and He will edify you, He will strengthen you, He will fill you up again. So there is no excuse really. And if you don't pray in tongues, then we love your faith, we pray for you, you can receive. Amen. It's available for every believer. It's not forced upon every believer. But if you have faith and you want it, every believer can have it. There are some believers, unforgiveness in their heart, hatred towards other people, other tribes. And yet they are praying with all their heart against the enemy. Nothing happens. They're praying for healing. Nothing happens. The enemy is not fleeing. They wonder why. Maybe it doesn't work. No, don't say maybe it doesn't work. Get back to the Lord. Ask the Lord for wisdom. The Lord will say, unforgiveness. Get rid of that. Submit to Christ. As you submit, He will flee. 
The devil understands submission and authority. He knows you have no authority on your own. You have authority only when you are submitted to his authority. Amen. That's why stay under. As Ron Bruce said, stay under. He that dwells under the shadow of the Almighty. He is the one who no evil will befall. No plague will come on them. Stay under. Hallelujah. Are you blessed this morning? Come on, let's stand to our feet. If you have been blessed through this podcast, we invite you to partner with us in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ from Nagaland to the nations. We make all our series available for free, but it does cost us time, effort, and money to do it. So the support of people such as you will enable us to reach more people in more regions. Remember, when you give, the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 9 8 that God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency, all things, may have an abundance of every good work. If you would like to support our media ministry on a monthly basis or through a one-time gift, kindly write to us at faithharvestnagaland at gmail.com and visit our website www.faithharvest.in and you can go to the giving section. You can also give through this UPI ID 700 at Paytm. God bless you and thank you so much for your generosity.